You are watching the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. The podcast for watch enthusiasts on a budget. Your host for today's podcast is Dr. Ed DeVries, an amateur horologist whose personal collection includes Timex, Rolex, and everything in between. If you are interested in dive watches, dress watches, designer watches, military watches, automatic watches, hand winding watches, quartz watches, or pocket watches the Poor Boys Horology Podcast is about to become your favorite podcast. So click like and subscribe. Then sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode of the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. Welcome to the February 2021 Poor Boys Horology Podcast Show. My name's Dr. Ed DeVries. For the next several minutes, I'll be your host here on the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. Let's start by doing a quick wristwatch check. You see here that I'm wearing a Swatch System 51. And what's unique about this Swatch System 51 is that it is a fully automatic Swiss-made movement, 17 joules Swiss-made movement, that was made entirely by robots. Human hands never touch the production of this wristwatch. Another thing that's interesting about this wristwatch is that this watch has a stainless steel case and a stainless steel band. Maybe you can see the swatch, uh, the, the three uh, links there uh, in a typical swatch band, but it's a stainless steel band rather than a rubber band. And the reason that I'm wearing the swatch today is because a large portion of today's podcast is going to be dedicated to Swatch watches. When I was in high school in 1986, rather actually I was still in middle school in 1986, in 1986 the Swatch GB111 was released. It was affectionately referred to by Swatch as Sir Swatch. And in 1986, I went to go buy a new wristwatch. The one that I was wearing needed to be replaced. And the Swatch watches had come out in 1983. And Swatch was all the craze at the time. All the cool people wore Swatch watches. So I went down to the uh, local uh, department store. It was a Neiman Marcus department store. Maybe it was the Marshall Fields department store. In downtown Chicago, maybe it was Carson Perry Scott. Those were the three department stores that I would have had opportunity to go to back in the day. And I believe it was one of those three. Might have been Marshall Fields, probably. That seemed to be a place we shopped a lot back then. But went to the department store. And I went to the watch counter. And they had a Swatch section. And I saw Sir Swatch. And I thought, wow, awesome looking watch. And I paid, I want to say, $35 for it at the time and slapped it on my wrist. And I wore that watch in 7th grade, 8th grade. I wore it my freshman year of high school, maybe some of my sophomore year of high school. And then I don't remember. I ended up getting another watch. I don't remember why. Uh, but Sir Swatch was a part of my life every day for uh, quite a long time. In fact, here he is, folks, Sir Swatch. Sir Swatch. And uh, this is a 34 millimeter watch, and it has, um, as you can see here, this is the way it came from the Swatch factory, with the red band on the bottom and the green band on the top. At some point, I want to say after I'd wore this for just a few months, I decided this was too cheesy. And so what I did is I replaced the band that came with it. I replaced it with a solid black band with a solid black clasp. And I thought that looked a little classier, a little more dignified, especially with that uh, black face that has the Sir Swatch coat of arms. And I just thought it was a really dignified looking wristwatch. That's the way you think when you're in middle school. But just recently, this watch has been restored to its original glory with red and green band. The face was polished. I remember when I was in middle school, I used to scratch this thing up all the time. And there was a local jewelry store that I would go to, and I would spend just, I think it was a dollar, literally. I think I gave the guy a dollar, and he would polish it for me, and it would look good as new. Anyways, this is Sir Swatch. This is a, uh, let's see now, this would be from uh, 1986 to uh, 2021. That would make this... I want to say a 33-year-old watch. I mean, it's amazing. And I put a battery in this thing here. And what I really liked about swatches 
is you see here you put a coin in that slot there and it just turns and you got access to the battery you replace the battery uh, by the way if you ever see a swatch store they have them in the caribbean if you're a cruise ship passenger just about every port of call probably has a swatch store florida has a few swatch stores they're located around the country in some outlet malls some different places if you ever go to a swatch store uh, they will replace the battery for you free of charge. No questions asked. You just walk in with a swatch. Say, hey, can I have a new battery? And they screw off the back here. And they put a new battery in. They hand it back to you. They'll even polish the front there for you. Polish the uh, the plastic crystal for you, if you will. And it's amazing how Swatch just does a really good job of taking care of its uh, customers. And it's amazing how small this is on my wrist didn't seem small when I was in middle school or even in high school. Anyways, I had reached out to the Swatch company for information on this watch. I told them I did a podcast, the Poor Boy Serology podcast, and I wanted to talk about this watch, this uh, this piece of my personal history, if you will. And so I reached out to the Swatch company in Switzerland, and I told them what I wanted to do. And it's amazing they mailed me this. This is the newly released Sir Swatch. It's 41 millimeters as opposed to 34. You can see it's considerably bigger. I like the way it wears on my wrist. Wears much nicer. Anyways, um, this is the 41 millimeter Sir Swatch here. The new Sir Swatch. The Swatch group told me, they said that Sir Swatch has come back into production. That so many people have asked about it. And then here just a few months ago, they started producing this watch again. And since they knew I would be mentioning it here on a podcast that gets now, uh, you know, a couple thousand views every time we, we put one up here now, and we hope that'll grow. By the way, click like and subscribe. When you click like and subscribe, you'll get notifications when we put up a new podcast. It will also help our channel tremendously. And so Swatch sent me this. They FedExed it to me. It took three days to get to me. And I got this in the mail here by Federal Express. And I um, could put this on my wrist. And uh, I like the way it wears on my wrist. In fact, I've been wearing this for about three weeks. And I put on the System 51 watch. And just so that I wouldn't be wearing the watch that I was featuring on the podcast for the wristwatch check. I know, that seems a little silly. <clears throat> Anyways, I want to show you how that looks on the wrist there. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Ah, yeah, you see that right there. I um, cut myself chopping some firewood, but anyways, um, beautiful, 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 beautiful watch, and um, Sir Swatch, that's what we're going to be talking about today is some Swatch watches, but first, uh, we are going to have a commercial break. It will be from our friends over at TBR Magazine, the Barnes Review Magazine, about a 45-second commercial. And then we'll be back here on the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. I've actually gotten a few emails from Poor Boys Horology Podcast viewers asking if I was a radio guy, and yes, I am. Apparently, I must uh, do this show in much the same way I do my radio talk shows. I'm the host of three shows, talk shows. Maybe uh, some of that comes off in the way I'm doing this show. Anyways, as you can see here, I have lighting issues in my office because my office is used as a radio studio, not really a video studio, and I figured out how to correct the lighting as you can see here, but then it casts a shadow. Anyways, let me turn this light off here. And now we're back to normal. You don't have a big shadow of my boom microphone on my chest. But I want to talk about some Swatch watches. 
When Swatch came out in 1983, it was because the Swiss watchmakers were concerned with what they called the quartz crisis. People were buying quartz watches. They weren't really buying mechanical watches anymore. And so the Swiss watchmakers had to keep up with that. So they came up with the Swatch watch. And it, they were quartz watches. And they were intended to be disposable watches because that was what the Swiss considered quartz watches to be, disposable watches. And so there's no way to service this watch. As you can see, it's fully encased in plastic. The only way, now you can get access to the battery to replace the battery. And obviously this is a well-made watch because this one here is 35 years old. I think I said 33 years a few moments ago. My math is bad. I don't really do it in my head well. 35 years old, this watch still ticking. I don't know how many batteries have been in it over those years, but this watch is still ticking. But eventually that quartz movement's going to die, and when it does, throw the watch away. That's what the Swiss watchmakers intend, and then you just buy another quartz watch. But these are extremely well made. Anyways, but they're made of disposable materials. It's designed to be a throwaway watch. That's what the Swiss watchmakers thought of quartz watches. The Swatch Group, as we know it today, of course, um, the Swiss ETA movements that we see in a lot of watches. For example, my Hamilton watch has a uh, Swiss ETA movement in it. And you can buy an Invicta watch that comes either with the NH35 uh, Japanese-made automatic movement or it comes with a Swiss ETA movement. That generic Swiss ETA movement that you see in a lot of watches is actually owned by and manufactured by the Swatch Group. But back in the 80s, the Swatch Group just made disposable quartz watches. In the 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s, they would come up with an uh, automatic watch. They charged a lot of money for it. I say that it was a few hundred dollars, which at that time was a lot of money. But you were getting a Swiss automatic watch. They really weren't very popular, so another decade or so passed. And... The Swatch Group made no effort whatsoever to make an automatic Swatch watch. And then, of course, the System 51 watches came out. And this watch, like I said earlier in the broadcast, manufactured by robots. Human hands do not touch this watch. The reason that they call it a System 51 is because there are 51 pieces in this watch. That includes the band, the clasp, the crown, the bezel, the crystal... It includes the pieces inside the watch movement itself. The dial, the hands, everything. Uh, 51 pieces total. The fewer pieces, uh, the less complex the robots have to be to put it together. I want to talk about this watch for just a second. And I like this watch. I bought this watch, I don't know, maybe two years ago now. And I love this watch. I don't wear it very often. But uh, I do wear it occasionally. And, and I love this watch. I'm assuming I'm going to get 10 or 15 years of service out of this watch. Now, you can't really see the back here. It is a, a exhibition case back. You can kind of see the movement in there. My camera is not really going to um, going to give us that. Let's turn the light back on. Okay, with the light on, you can see a little bit of that watch movement. Maybe I should have taken the time to take the bracelet off, but I did not do that. There's no way to get to that movement to service it. That case back does not come off. Like the plastic counterpart, even in the stainless steel swatch, is designed to be a disposable watch. By the way, I bought this on eBay for about $60, brand new, to buy a Swiss-made, fully mechanical watch for under $100 is just phenomenal. I mean, mind-blowing that you can do this. Uh, but needless to say, uh, this 17 Joule uh, automatic mechanical movement is intended to be a throwaway. So one of these days it's going to stop working. It's going to need service. And there is absolutely no way to take this case apart to get to that movement. Absolutely none whatsoever. So I'll just have to toss this at that point. <clears throat> Some interesting things about this watch. If you look at the dial there, trying to get it in, into some light here. Uh, for you, you look at that dial there, and you see the indices. They are they are luminescent indices. This watch does have loom. Uh, the markers glow when I'm in a dark place. 
So I look at my watch in the middle of the night while I'm sleeping, and the markers glow, and they have really good loom. But look at the hands. There's no loom on the hands. So you can't tell the time. Crazy. Uh, it's almost like they they made this watch with spare parts. I, I don't know what they were thinking. But it keeps good time. It's an accurate watch. It's a beautiful watch. And uh, let's see. Now, I've been wearing this watch. Uh, I put this watch on Saturday morning. I went to the rocket launch at Wallops Island. And I put this watch on at about 8 o'clock Saturday morning. And it is now Monday at 6.26 p.m. So that is uh, 24.48. Um, I have wore this watch now for uh, probably uh, 60-some hours. And it's still... Um, my computer says 626. My watch says 626. It's keeping, it keeps accurate time. Within a few seconds a day, probably. So um, maybe mine's just calibrated really well. I don't know. But these are reliable timepieces. And I assume I'm going to get 10 to 15 years of service out of it. I don't know. We're going to find out. Uh, but for however long, I get to own a quality Swiss-made timepiece for under $100. This watch here, the 34 millimeter Swiss watch, Dating from 1986, this watch here, 35 years old. Like I said, paid $35 for it, brand new, I believe, at Marshall Fields, which was a high-end department store in Chicago. And then this 41 millimeter that the Swatch Company sent to me the other day. Uh, this is, a, I believe, it sells for $80 on their website, which is about the going rate for the uh, plastic swatches today. Anyways, we're going to have a commercial break. And then we'll be back here uh, in under a minute with more of the Poor Boys Herology podcast. Extra, extra, we all about it. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. Extra, extra, read all about it. I had mentioned in the last segment having attended the rocket launch at Wallops Island, Virginia on Saturday. And I know what's going to happen is uh, some of you are going to hear that and then you're going to send me an email. Uh, Dr. Ed, Dr. Ed, show us the footage of the rocket launch from Wallops Island. And so rather than having to figure out a way to work that into next month's program, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to share with you uh, just a very brief uh, video that was shot there at Wallops Island. If you're wondering what is on the split screen with me right now, that is a picture that I took with my iPhone through my binoculars. I actually put my binoculars up to the lens of my iPhone and took a picture of the rocket on the launch pad from about three miles away. I was standing in the middle of what used to be a cornfield. It'll be a cornfield again this spring when they replant the next crop of corn. And I was about three miles away and looking over the Chickateague Bay at the launch pad. Wait. Yeah, we could have. Yeah, there we go. 
the phone with our good friend Clint Lacey. So your newest project is you've started a publishing company, Foothills Media, and uh, you'll be publishing uh, three tremendous books. Uh, the first of those is your book, The Beginner's Guide to False Flags. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that book? If you're wondering how we ended up at this point in our history and everything's going on, Beginner's Guide to False Flag takes you from the beginning of the country until uh, the election of Donald Trump, Charlottesville, the rise of the communists, and the Russian collusion hoax, the rape of Delaware County, the story in which a United States veteran uh, defended himself against a known uh, drug felon, only to find out that the local police were in on it. Crooked prosecutors, and one of those prosecutors was actually arrested coming back from uh, an island in the Caribbean uh, in a murder for hire plot. And it just details uh, just how corrupt one small county can be. And in the book, I said that Delaware County, Oklahoma, in the past was a safe haven for uh, outlaws from Missouri and Arkansas. And what the reader will find out, it still is. Blood in the Ozarks, expanded second edition, 156 year old government cover, cover up in which out of control a union officer led his men to uh, murder men, women, and children at a Christmas gathering in the Missouri Ozark. I found it Foothills Media in uh, 2019 because I'm dedicated to bringing you the truth. Thank you, Clint. I know that our listeners are going to want to check out Foothills Media, so tell them how they can do so. Well, you can visit us at foothillsmedia.net, and that will take you to our website where you can uh, browse the books, read our blog posts, and uh, uh, catch up on news that you won't find anywhere else in the mainstream media. Foothillsmedia.net. It's interesting, it's ironic, it's coincidental that the timing of this program when I would be talking about something from back when I was in the 80s, back when I was in high school, I had another ritual besides wearing Sir Swatch, and that was that starting in 1988, I would sneak out to the car during high school and I would listen to Rush Limbaugh on the radio. I remember in 1988 when the Rush Limbaugh program first came out, I had a friend named Scott, and he told me one day, he said, Ed, he said, you've got to listen to this guy named Rush Limbaugh. He has a radio show out in New York. And so I slipped out during my lunch period, and I listened to part of the Rush Limbaugh show with him there on the car radio. And I was immediately hooked. And so I had a study hall period uh, for the remainder of my high school. I scheduled a study hall period for right before lunch, and then I had my lunch hour, and then I had another period after that, and I don't even remember what that period was. One year, I think it was algebra, or algebra two, or something, but what I would do is I would skip the study hall period, I would skip the lunch period, and quite often, I would even skip that third period after lunch, and I would sit out in the car, and I would listen to Rush Limbaugh on the radio. I did a tribute to Rush Limbaugh on my other shows, and I'm not going to do the full tribute here. I'm not going to play the same clips from the Rush Limbaugh show over the years that I played on the talk shows. And the reason why is because this is a watch podcast. And so I want to keep what we do here relatable to horology and to watches. I can say I was wearing Sir Swatch when I was listening to Rush Limbaugh on the radio, at least for part of that time. But something that I said on my radio talk shows was that Rush Limbaugh was kind of like Mr. Rogers for adults. And unlike Mr. Rogers, we never outgrew him. And so for the last 33 years, I've been listening every day to Rush Limbaugh. And now he's gone. And there's there's an emptiness there. When you listen to somebody every day for three hours for 33 years, they become a part of your life. Now, I had the privilege of getting to meet Rush when I was a teenager. When I was still in high school, I went to a Rush to Excellence tour appearance that Rush made. It just so happened 
that uh, during the question and answer time, and there were fifteen to twenty thousand people in a basketball arena, and Russia only took about twenty questions, and all the questions were submitted in advance. It just so happened that my question was one of the ones that was selected, and Rush asked, said, "Hey, who asked this question? Would you please stand up?" And I stood up, and he was, you know, amazed that a teenager had asked him this question, and so he just began to really just pour some advice into me. And I got to meet Rush after the show. It changed my life. That night changed my life. It really did. One of the reasons that I went into talk radio myself was having been inspired by a Rush Limbaugh. Anyways, back in 2018, I was celebrating the one-year anniversary of my TBR radio show. TBR Radio presents the Dixie Heritage Show. And Rush helped me to celebrate that milestone in my life by sending me the certificate that you now see on the side of your screen. And Rush, of course, um, the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies does not award degrees, as Rush said many times, time and again. So he did not send me an honorary degree. Rather, he sent me an honorary title. And the honorary title was Doctor of Broadcast Excellence. Even before that, I had asked Rush, I, I asked him one day, I said, hey, Rush, you know, you've got your, your golden EIB microphone. I said, how do I get a golden microphone for my radio show? And he told me, he said, actually, he said, you can buy them on eBay. He said, I've ordered you one, but it'll take a few weeks to come in the mail from China. <laughs> and so uh, anyways, it was my privilege to have had a friendship of sorts with Rush Limbaugh uh, through the years, and he will be sadly missed. And so what I want to do is I want to at least use part of today's show to do a tribute to Rush Limbaugh. And uh, Rush was a big fan of Apple Watches and Apple products. And so we're going to do our tribute by having just some some segments from the Rush Limbaugh show where Rush was talking about uh, the Apple Watch. I thought about doing this show on Apple Watches as a tribute to Rush. But I've never owned an Apple Watch, and, you know, I would just be reading specs. So so let El Rushbo uh, tell us, with half of his brain tied behind his back, tell us with 99.8% accuracy about that which he wore every day and loved so much, the Apple Watch. But first, I want to introduce a new segment to this show, and I'm going to start putting them in there every month, and I'm going to be talking with my personal physician, Dr. William G. Von Peters. And every month he's going to share just two or three minutes of something that will help us with our health. And this month he's going to tell us how we can boost our immune systems because there are so many things out there that we do not want to catch. And so Dr. Von Peters is going to tell us how to boost our immune system. And then uh, we'll have Rush Limbaugh doing his review of the Apple Watch. I'm on the phone again with Dr. William Von Peters, who has been my uh, personal doctor for the last 10 years. For whatever reason, people are afraid of COVID, or if they're not afraid of COVID, they're they're definitely afraid of catching something right now. I think with all the hysteria in the media, all the hype that's been built up, people are just afraid of catching something. And you were telling me the other day that uh, you have a product there in, in your line, your homeopathic line that was an immunosystem booster, not really a drug, but just something that we would take. It's, it's a natural formulation that would help boost our immune systems and decrease our chances of catching all of the things that are supposed to be out there right now. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about that? We do have a formula that I designed based off of the symptomology they were saying because homeopathy, homeopathy, you know, the the philosophy is like cures like, and whereas allopathy, which is what the MDs use, is opposite cures. <laughs> so, you know, if you have something that, for example, if something's too hot, you give something that would cause a heat in the body, and it will it will tend to dissipate the heat. Then, uh, you know, such as coffee on a hot day, is uh, is an example of that in real life. But anyway, uh, so, you know, we have some, some things. I have to develop one called Corona Quest, which basically covers the, you know, all the symptoms they were claiming that the, uh, uh, that it has primarily just as a preventive to help the body, uh, hopefully be able to recognize the coronavirus. 
product. Uh, we don't make, in none of our products do we make medical claims for. Them. Uh, you know, it's just to assist the body in, in healing and being able to heal itself. Because if you start making medical claims, then, of course, they're going to come after you. So, like the Corona Quest, it's designed to assist the, assist the body in uh, recognizing the coronavirus and strengthening the immune system against it. But we make no medical claims for it. And so if somebody wants to get a bottle of this and try it for themselves, what do they need to do? Basically, just go to the website uh, for, the, for a company, LifeQuest Formulas. And so that would be www.lifequestformulas, that's plural, lifequestformulas.com. All right, lifequestformulas.com. And for our radio listeners who happen to be watching on YouTube, that'll be on the screen as well. You'll want to go to LifeQuest Formulas and you'll want to check this out and you'll want to check out some of the other homeopathic products that Dr. Von Peters is offering there as well. Man, oh man, where to begin? Where to begin today? We can begin with Comedy Central once again ripping off your host. We can start with Baltimore. You're what the mayor said in Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We hand to give... Those who wish to destroy space, space to do that. We gave those who wish to destroy space to do that in the inner harbor. Gangs in Baltimore have made a pact with one another to unify against the cops and not take out each other. So we got Baltimore. We got the latest on the Clinton crime family uh, syndicate up there known as the, the Clinton Foundation. We got George Stephanopoulos... <laughs> George Stephanopoulos on, on, on this week, yesterday, talking to the author of the book on the, on the Clintons, Peter Schweitzer, accusing him of being a partisan. How the hell can you say this? You're a partisan. As though Stephanopoulos is some objective, never been involved in any politics before. And he's a partisan? What the hell is Stephanopoulos? One half of the Clinton war room back in the 1990s. Anyway, there's all kinds of stuff like that that just stretches credulity out there. And, uh, and and credibility. And then we've got, oh, uh, we have the, um, uh, the the White House Correspondents' Dinner. There's some stuff there that we might uh, want to get into as well. Oh, I just saw this. I actually got an email from a friend of mine in Kansas who said, look, screw all the rest of this stuff. The most important thing is your review of your Apple Watch. No, it's not. That's not the most important thing. I'll be glad to give you my thoughts on the Apple Watch, but they don't differ much from what I thought it was going to be. I mean, anything you can do on the phone, you can do on the watch. Or let me the other way, any way you can do on the watch, you can do on the phone because the watch is, a, is a, for the most part, 99% slave. The watch will, will keep time by itself. The watch will do alarms and timers and all that by itself. And it will connect to, an, to a Wi-Fi network that it knows by itself. Uh, other than that, you need your phone for it. And it came in handy Saturday exactly as I thought. Played golf at a place that doesn't allow cell phones. So I stuck my phone in in my golf bag in a compartment. Nobody would ever go into it. And I wore the watch. And I got you know some messages and notifications that I would have missed during my round otherwise. Uh, thankfully, none of them were emergencies. But that's exactly how I thought it would come in handy. It's pretty cool. I mean, the tech, there's no question it's cool, but I'm just going to tell you exactly as I thought. If I've got my phone here and I've got my watch and something happens, I'm going to use the phone. I'll tell you one thing where the watch is better. Siri. I am convinced, and there's been a couple of news stories about the new back end at Apple's U. They're on their third iteration of Siri, as it turns out, software-wise. I'm telling you, the dictation on this watch is flawless. It has yet to make a mistake since I set it up and paired it Friday afternoon. It has yet to make an input mistake. It has translated everything I've said 100% correctly. I'm convinced that it's a different Siri. And of course, it has to be good because there's no other input. You can't type on it. The only way you can communicate with it is to uh, dictate. Uh, now, in the Messages app, there are some stock things. You can click on the word thank you, click on thanks, click I can't talk now and send that, but you can't create anything other than with your voice. Did you hear about the guy 
who says, and it's true, by the way, that his Apple Watch saved his life. The Apple Watch, he sleeps with it because he monitors his sleep. Apple Watch has sleep apps, and you can monitor your sleep, whether you have apnea, how deep REM sleep you're in and all that. But it also has a heart app. And in the latest version of the software, it is much more detailed, the data that is collected on your heart and reflected on the watch. Uh, your resting heart rate, uh, your recovery heart rate, your walking heart rate. But there's also a feature. This guy was awakened at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning by his watch because his resting heart rate was 120. He woke up. He felt like he had indigestion. And he took a couple of Tums. But it still didn't feel right. So as a precaution, he went to the emergency room. And he ended up needing four stints surgically implanted. His doctor told him that if he had not awakened, he wouldn't have awakened. He would have had a heart attack in his sleep and would have died. Now, I didn't know the feature was there. I mean, I have a heart app, and I use it to measure the heart rate and all that. So I went into the settings, and there is a setting where you can have the watch alarm you, vibrate, and wake you up if your heart rate at rest only exceeds whatever you set it to be, 90, 100, 110, 120. You can change that setting. Uh, and I was explaining this to somebody. You mean it's going gonna, it's gonna to go off when I'm in the gym? I said, no, no, no. This is the resting heart rate. It measures. It knows the difference when you're not moving as opposed to when you're walking or when you're exercising. or It's your resting heart rate. So I looked in there, and mine was set by default at 100 beats a minute. And I've been meaning to tell this story, not not because of the watch so much, just because of the, well, it is the watch, but still it's just an incredible story. And I didn't even know the feature was there until I read about this. One of our big sponsors here on the Poor Boys Horology podcast is TBR Magazine, the Barnes Review Magazine. And one of the contributing editors at the Barnes Review is my good friend, Harold Scharnhorst, Harold Hestovich Scharnhorst. Harold is someone who I have enjoyed interviewing several times on both of my radio shows. And, you know, if if, uh, if this weren't a horology podcast, I would interview him right here on this show as well. Uh, but Harold had a tremendous story to tell. Uh, when he was a little boy, his dad basically raised the army that repelled the Nazi invasion of Norway during the Second World War. And so Harold grew up uh, with a dad who was basically the commander of the Norwegian armed forces. He was the leader of the Norwegian underground. And then when the war was over, uh, Harold and his family emigrated here to the United States. And Harold ended up enlisting in the United States Army. He ended up uh, working some very interesting jobs. Currently, he is a professional photographer, writer, and broadcaster living in the state of Idaho. And he took all of his story and he wrote it down in a 470-page book. And this 470-page book has over 300 photographs. And the book is called An Immigrant Remembers. Harold sent me a copy of this book about two years ago and I read it and the story was fascinating. I could not put it down. An Immigrant Remembers. And... You'll want, to, you'll want to get your hands on this book. You really will. And you can do so, of course. you see it on the screen, the cover of An Immigrant Remembers by Harold Testament Scharnhorst. And you can go to Harold's blog, www.halscharnblog.blogspot.com. That's www dot hal sharn blog dot blogspot dot com that's up on your screen right now you can email harold homefrontbooks at alpine montana dot com or you could go to harold's facebook page again all of these contact informations are on your screen or just mail thirty dollars to homefront publishing p.o box 55 moye springs idaho 83845 again it's on your screen you want to read this tremendous dynamic book 
an immigrant remembers. It was a story that as I was reading this book, I just couldn't put it down. And you won't be able to put it down either. And so you'll want to read this great story, An Immigrant Remembers, by Harold Hestevit Scharnhorst. Go back, hit rewind, hit pause, so that you can get your hands on this contact information and order a copy of this great book, An Immigrant Remembers, by Harold Hestevit Scharnhorst. checked email during the break. Uh, You didn't tell us about the battery life of the watch. It's not a problem, folks. This, at least in my usage, and I spent quite a bit of time on Friday playing with it, using it much more than I'm, anybody will use it during normal course of events after you have it and got the playing with it out of your system. This watch, for me, is going to get anywhere from 16 to 20 hours on a, on a charge. It isn't going to be a hassle. But even if it weren't, I'd just plug in the second watch, while, use it while the first watch is charging. But that hasn't been a problem. In fact, the battery life is uh, is stupendous. So if that's something that's got you concerned, uh, don't let it be. We're going to close today's Poor Boys Horology podcast. If you have a show idea or if you'd just like to reach out to me, the host, email me at poorboyshorologypodcast at aol.com. The email address is on your screen. In the meantime, know that I'll be back again, same time, same place, next month, with another Poor Boys Horology podcast. If you'd like a notification of that ahead of time, click like and subscribe. Not only does it help the channel, but it makes sure that YouTube sends you a notice every time we put up a new episode. The Poor Boys Horology podcast is an ED media production.